you're a Christian, you know that the primary way that God teaches us, grows us, makes us more like Jesus in our walk and uh, uses us in the world, the primary way that God does that is through the Bible, His Word, uh, what we call the Scripture. Uh, in the Old Testament, put together with the New Testament, we have the full 66 books. We know that it is important, fundamental, essential, and absolutely necessary to be feeding on the Word of God in order to be growing. But a part of that is the very fact that there is truth in this book, that God has revealed Himself, things about Himself, His gospel, His eternal plan in His Son, how He accomplishes that, how He demands we then live in light of that, when He's coming back, what will take place at that time, and what the future of eternity will look like. All of this is shown to us, taught to us in the Bible. And so it's so essential that we know what we believe. As Christians, we are, as we uh, see in the commandments of Paul, we are needing to devour the word and understand truth so that we are not tossed about back and forth by every little wind and wave of doctrine that false teachers bring across our way or, or comes across our screen on the internet. So we need to know what we believe. But we also need to know why we believe it. This is a, a part of the Christian uh, uh, discipline of apologetics. This comes in many different shapes and sizes, but it's essential that we also start developing an understanding of why we believe certain things. It, this means that we need to be, be growing in our ability to question our traditions question our assumptions and our presuppositions because there's many schools of thought or many teachings in the Christian world that that you might have learned and in order to have a biblical understanding you need to unlearn those things and relearn what the scripture will actually say about them so we are engaged and we encourage here at Hope Church for each of us to be asking the question of not just what am I being taught what is being shown to me, but why is this being shown? Can I see this in Scripture? I mean, we believe in the Trinity. Can I defend that biblically? We believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Can I defend that biblically, even historically? I believe in justification by faith alone. Can I defend that biblically? This is a part of uh, the discipline of, of knowing not just what we believe, but why. Well, today we're actually going, we're starting our series really going back to the very first question we should be asking. Uh, everything that we defend or believe, we say we believe this because we see it in the Bible. We believe this because God has told us so in Scripture. Well, today we're going even a step further back than that and asking the question, why is it that we trust the Bible? Or can we, in fact, trust this book, the Bible, to be the Word of God? Make a quick caveat here and say, I'm not asking the question, can we trust God? Can we trust that God speaks to us trustworthily, honestly, inerrantly, infallibly? I'm not asking that question because to ask it is to answer it. Of course, if God speaks to us humans, if God reveals himself, when he speaks, it will always be true. It will always be trustworthy. His words are not hung in the balance and tested. He is the balance. He is the test. He is the norm, which normalizes, tests, uh, or dis, uh, uh, disregards all other things. He is the final say and final measure on all things. But what we're asking is, this leather-bound 66-book Bible that we have... Can we be confident that these books are in fact God's word? And of course we can be and we are and we are sure of that. But I'm asking the question today, can, can you answer the question as to why we have these books and not other books in our Bible? So this series will be how or why do we trust the Bible? Why, why do we trust this Bible to be the words of God? What's our What's our ultimate aim here? Or what was the cause of this series being begun? Well, in not just recent years, in the recent few hundred years, but uh, especially in the, in the, with the, 
uh, rise of of the internet age and especially the the access that everyday Christians have to scholarly and academic material, which is an amazing thing and a great thing that has come with it and it's had its fair share of uh, negatives as well. So that all Christians sitting in the pew are um, can be met with academic arguments that criticize or go against the Bible that maybe in, in many generations past, really the only people having to wrestle with those arguments were the Christian scholars and were the, the biblical theologians and, and ha- being so equipped with their arguments, they could easily, or with some work, but, but thoroughly uh, uh, put down the arguments raised up against the Lord and His Word. But today we have those arguments coming not just against scholars, but against the very people who, who may not have the, the, the uh, scholarly or historically informed arguments to defend that. We have these scholarly critiques coming into the pew. There's, there's books written every year attacking the, the books of the Bible. They're, they're very cleverly named, you know, the, the mistakes in New Testament scripture or, or why the Bible is not all that... Um, it claims to be these very tricky titles trying to intrigue Christians make us think oh well I've been taught this all my life and there's th- th- this book has now come up with some new discovery and it's going to actually show me something that the, the Christian theologians don't want me to know so the, 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 the critics bypass a lot of Christian theologians and go straight to uh, the lay people straight to the flock straight to the church well, it's my aim today to help you understand how, how very clearly God has, has, uh, uh, has shown to us that, that these critiques can be answered. We don't need a degree in order to be confident that these books in our Bible are God's word. And we're going to uh, be um, uh, exploring that idea of what we call the canon. Now, we, if we were to spell it with two N's, we would be meaning something that shoots, uh, you know, balls at a ship. But what we mean by canon is spelt with one N. It means the, the, uh, the books included in the Bible. If an, uh, it means that the books that are attributed to an author. If I was to have a, have a uh, history of having written 50 books, then the canon of my authorship would be those 50 books. Uh, uh, and so when we talk about the Bible, we mean... Uh, the canon are those accepted books of the Bible that we accept and receive as God's holy word, as scripture. That's the canon. There are many other books out there that claim to be that. We don't include them in the canon. So we in, in Christian theology, we talk about a closed canon, meaning that we're not still adding books onto the Bible. We have a closed canon. So that's what we mean by canon. But in this session, what, uh, this series, what we're going to be doing is defining canon, what we mean by it, and defending the canon, saying that we'll, we'll define what it means and then we will defend the fact that the Bible we have, the books we have, are in fact an accurate canon of Holy Scripture. I want to uh, just introduce a couple of ideas that you might have heard uh, uh, and, and one of the reasons we'll be looking at this. There's, there's all sorts of tricky uh, understandings or misunderstandings about how our New Testament was put together. I want to ask you, have you ever thought about how we went from having apostles walking around, preaching sermons, planting churches, and writing letters, the epistles and the books of the New Testament, how we went from that period of history to the period of history where they then had a, a full book closed, bound up, calling it the Bible with all of these books in there. Have you ever thought about the process it would have taken to get to that? How long did it take to get to that stage? Was there a fair, good, trustworthy process that got it to that stage, that that picked some books and called it the Bible? Maybe you've heard the theory in relation to this that, that you know there was just all of these hundreds of books going around that were christian scriptures or or christianly uh, you know accepted by the churches being taught and then at the council of nicaea in 325 constantine and and his men they picked just some of the books that they wanted the 27 books that they wanted and they put them together and said this now is the new testament 
if you oppose this, you're punished. And they, they gave that book to the churches. And that's the one that we now have. That was uh, why historically we have the books we have. That was a theory that was popularized a lot by the Da Vinci Code. If you ever read that or watched that movie, that was the, the real uh, assumption uh, and story behind that book. Uh, it's quite a, uh, a misdirection, a complete uh, uh, ahistorical, and by that I mean a non-historically accurate uh, theory. And we'll, we'll explore that a bit. Uh, maybe you've heard of other books, that, and this is what people often say, that there are so many other books that should be in the New Testament. That should be in the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard of the book of Enoch. Maybe you've heard of the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Peter. These guys were all apostles. They, they sound like they should, if there's a gospel written by them, they should be tacked into the book, surely. And the fact that there's not, here's where it gets interesting. Critics say that the fact that those books aren't in scripture means that there was some agenda. Some, some people picked certain books and not others in order to keep these people submissive or get themselves power or, or money or whatever it was. There was an agenda at play into the picking of these books and it wasn't fairly done. So you shouldn't trust it. And, and if, the, if everything you've ever believed about the Bible can't be trusted, then who even knows what's true? That's, that's one of the, the stories that gets told. And that's what we're fighting against today. Maybe even you've, you've seen on Facebook or coming up on, uh, on the news sites, you've seen, uh, and it happens every couple of years, some, some big uh, clickbait article that will say, new book found in the Egyptian desert or in the Mediterranean that demolishes everything Christians have ever believed. Or, or, or they find a new book attributed back to the, the first century and say, uh, you know, that, that in this book, a new book that wasn't in scripture has been found and in it we learn all of this very interesting things about Jesus or about the apostles or about Christianity. And so they throw all of this this confusion on the whole matter by, by claiming there's a new book. It'll undo the other books that you have in your Bible. It'll show that there was, there was, there's something going on here that early Christian theologians didn't want us to know. These claims come up every couple of years. It's very interesting, uh, quite comedic and, and uh, hilarious because none of them claim to be what they're claiming to be. But this happens. So, so, Modern, uh, common Christians may, may hear those things and be discouraged, not know how to defend that, not know how to treat that uh, phenomenon. But we're going to be talking about this in order that you might be, you might be equipped with arguments, with defenses for why we have the canon, why we have the one that we have and why the one that we have really is trustworthy. So at the moment, I'm going to actually start going through and we're going to do a bit of defining the canon. When we talk about the definition of the canon, there's, I guess, two main questions at play. One is, what is the canon? How do we define it strictly? What do we mean by it? And then the second part of the question is, when did it happen? So what is the canon? But also, when did the canon happen? I mean, if somebody was to claim, and I'm sure you can see how this would be a problem, if somebody was to claim that we finished a bi the biblical canon, we, we know which ones were written by God and we all finished it up, if somebody said that happened in 2010, 2,000 years after the resurrection of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel through the apostles, you would rightly, and I hope you would, start asking some questions. Why did that take so long? If there was no canon for so long, then why do the people in this generation at 2010 believe they've come across some clear revelation? So time really matters. And the way that you define what you mean by the canon, when we start, so again, when we talk about the canon, what we mean is when did those books get put together as an accepted, limited, unique set of God-inspired scripture? When was that accepted? And the way that we answer that question, or the way that we even define that more strictly, will defend, so the way we answer what, will uh, depend on, or will affect, when it happened. Just depending on how strictly or loosely you define canon, will depend, or will affect, when you say canon happened. So we're going to uh, jump into that a little bit more. If you're a bit confused, don't worry. We will 
uh, learn it in a bit more clarity. So I'm going to put when over here. This is my uh, my graph. This is going to this this axis across here is going to represent time. The when question. This is going to be the definition what question. So of course this is time going along. This is zero AD over here. Now let's make it, let's make it 30, 33 AD, approximately when Jesus would have been raised, uh, ascended up into heaven about then and the apostles started writing and preaching scripture. <clears throat> this over here is going to be uh, the time as it goes on further along. Now I'm going to give three different definitions, although not completely different, but three distinct definitions of the canon that are often argued or that are often uh, uh, pitted against each other. And we're going to see the way that we define it that way, where does that leave it on the timeline? The way that we define it this way, where does that put it on the timeline? And, and you'll see what I mean as we go. I'm borrowing these definitions, by the way, from Michael J. Michael J. Kruger, who is, I listened to many of his lectures. He's a He's an amazing lecturer. He's particularly a professor of New Testament, um, especially uh, specializing in the um, area of canon, which we're talking about today. He's, he's the president of the Reformed Theological Seminary over in Charlotte in North Carolina. So he's, he's amazing in what he does. And I've borrowed a couple of definitions from him. Uh, the, what, he, what he shows us is that there's three different ways that we can define canon. I'm going to talk about it uh, first in terms of the uh, recognition. So you can, you can define uh, the canon by when it was recognized as the canon by, by Christians. And so by this we mean that, uh, and this is what some people argue uh, is not a sufficient definition for canon. This is what some people argue as the only definition for canon. We're going to show how they actually are helpful together. When we say recognition, what we mean is, when did the church... We can say that there was a, a fair, trustworthy canon if we can look back in history and say that the church was using... was, was recognizing, openly stating... These are our canonical scriptural New Testament books. And when we see them saying that, and not until we say them saying, see them saying that in history, only then can we be sure that's when we have the canon. So this is going to put the, the uh, formulation of that quite late in history because you have to allow for the, the scriptures to be written and then passed around, and then collated, put together, and then eventually you need, if, if what you're waiting for is a statement of we recognize these as canonical scripture, then that's going to take even a bit more time for there to be some kind of counsel, some kind of agreement, some kind of written formulation of that. So, so if, we, if we define it strictly as meaning canon, the church had a canon, an established canon, when the church openly said, we now have these books from God and not others, these are specifically unique, then you end up having, the, having that take place fairly down the line of history. Some people will claim that didn't happen till 325 AD. That's not the case. 325 AD is in fact much further down the line than what this really happened. We've got and we'll look into this in future sessions, but we've got people in the end of the um, beginning of the second and end of the second uh, century starting to formulate lists of what scripture goes in. But but if that's how you want to define it, that's going to be a late uh, formulation of canon. Next of all, we can we could alternatively define it as um, not when it was recognised, but by a functional um, way of defining canon. So in this way, what we mean is we can understand that the church, the early church had the canon, had a canon. The canon was established 
when we can look back and see the Christians using those texts functionally as scripture. So they're saying, we don't need to wait until they formulate a, 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 a list or formulate a council that says we have a canon. No, we can say it's a bit before then. At some point in the, after they were written, you know, throughout the first century, at some point between them starting being written and probably before that date over here, in this period and onwards, they would have been used as scripture, even if there wasn't an official list. So, for example, they might say, can you find examples of the early church in this period taking up the book of 1 Corinthians and preaching it, preaching from it and regarding it as holy scripture to the exclusion of other books which aren't being treated that way? Is that what we find when we look in history? And of course it is that the early church was treating what we now call our New Testament they were treating that as scripture and preaching from certain books, reading certain of those, Pauline or, or, or from Peter or from James or from John, these other authors, they were reading from those letters in church and they weren't reading from other commonplace human written letters. There was a recognition in a functional way. So some people say, well, we define canon as that period there uh, they had a canon when they started functioning as if they had a canon. And to be able to say that, if that's how you define canon, then you can put the, uh, uh, the formulation of that. You can say, okay, well, it happened a bit earlier than when they made a formal list. So that's another way of defining canon. Or there's the, there's the third way. This will be the strictest, most theological way of defining canon. And what we mean here is, we call it the ontological, logical, wow, and it's on camera too, the ontological way of defining scripture. Um, or what we could say is God's point of view. God's point of view, the ontological view of Scripture. And what we mean by ontology, when we talk about ontology, we mean something's nature, the nature and essence and being of something. So you could say that ontologically, you are a human from the very conception in your mother's womb. Uh, you never, ch you're on your shape, your size, your environment, your dependence, your your intelligence, they all change over the years, but, and at some point we formally recognize you as a child or formally recognize the pregnancy or formally recognize you as an adult and they're all helpful, but at no point there did you become more human. You were always human. You were human before any person knew that you were in your mother's womb. Ontologically, you have always been human. That's your nature. And so this view of the canon says that the way we should, and the only way we should define canon is, when did God write his scripture? When did God, as in the language of uh, Second Timothy, when did God breathe out his words onto paper? Or in the language of Second Peter, when did God inspire his prophets and the apostles to um, to be carried along in their writing of scripture to put pen to paper and write down his books. And as soon as that happens, so as soon as Paul finished writing the book of Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, hit his full stop, folded it up, sent it with his courier over to the churches in Galatia. As soon as that has happened, that is canon. God's canon exists at least of Galatians at, at that point. And each scripture book, each epistle, each revelation that is given to his apostles that is written across the known world at that time and in varying times, as soon as those books are finished being written, that is another book that the Holy Spirit has inspired and whether or not it's put on any formal list yet and whether or not any other church recognizes and uses it as scripture, 
discovered or not, it simply is scripture because it is written by God. Not because of how it's being used, not because of how it's being recognized, but by the very nature of the fact that it is God's word. That means it is the canon. And so then you could say, well, the, the, when we formally have a canon then is a lot earlier than when people recognized it in a list, a lot earlier than when people utilize these books as Bible. But in fact, we have a full, complete, finished canon as soon as the last book of the New Testament was written. As soon as that final full stop was put, we have a, a complete official canon. Now, the church may not recognize it fully in all of that sense yet, but that's why we call the ontological definition God's point of view. If you were to ask God, when did you complete the canon? He would say, well, right back here in the late 80s or early 90s when he finished writing through his apostles the final book. Now, when we look at all of this, we have three different definitions and this is why it's helpful to define them because depending on how critics want to define the canon, they will say, uh, they can say it happens at later times. So if you were to be arguing with maybe a critic and they say there was no canon until, you know, even if they accept our terms and say the late second century, or they say the early fourth century, there was no canon until 325, you would have to say, well, let's define what we mean by canon. Do you mean an official, full, complete list of the 26 letters in every form? Okay, well, that will be quite late, yes. And yes, that is a few hundred years separated from the apostles, and maybe you claim there's been additives in there. And we'll talk about that in a future session. But if we define it as when it was being used as scripture, we can bring it a lot earlier. And in fact, if we, with the New Testament writers, accept that this is God's book, he ultimately gets to say when he's finished writing it and when, he, when he's given his church a full canon, we can bring it even earlier. So this all is helpful now as we go on from here to work with and defend the canon. We first need to recognize that we have a working definition. So my working definition with all of these, as Michael Kruger teaches, I'm going to actually use all of these together in different senses and in different ways. I think that they're all helpful in their different um, formulations for different purposes because there is a, a significance to the church formally recognizing and tabulating the books. There is a massive significance in the church using the books as functional scripture and there is a theological significance in accepting that this is God written, he ultimately has the say. So there are definitions of of canon that we're going to be working with. I think that will give us the most balanced way forward. And, and I want to talk now just to, as we finish off here, the reason that we have the problem of the canon, the reason that we as Christians have the issue, or we even have to have this teaching series, why there's even a possibility of arguments about which books should be in the canon and which shouldn't, and how do we defend it, we have to have this conversation because of human authorship. This is a source of the problem in many ways. What I mean by that is, if God, if God really wanted for his church and the world forever to never question never have any reason to doubt or question which books Yahweh wanted in the Bible, which books he wanted considered as scripture, then he would have just, you know, passed down a book written on golden leaf from heaven. It would have just come delivered, written by God's own hand. There was, there was miracles that surrounding it. It just landed down for everybody to see. And then from then on, Christians simply used the books that he wrote to teach, recognize the books that he wrote as canon. And that could have happened all the way back here. Jesus went up to heaven, Holy Spirit came down, and then bang, he sent down a book. That would be easier to defend in many ways. Of course, it would come up with its own problems. But the fact is, well, we can ask the question, why didn't God do that? 
Why didn't? Why did God say, in fact, as He did in uh, through Jesus to the apostles, say, "No, no, no. What I'm going to do is use you, the car, the, the the jars of clay, the sinful humans, the fallen humans, the 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 ones who are not infinite, who do not have all wisdom. I'm going to give you the task." of writing through human hand this not delivered down from heaven on golden paper but I'm going to use human authors to write the bible now it's uh it's it's in islam that they actually believe, uh, for example, uh, they don't believe in this human authorship, which we call, here's the doctrine of, inspiration. Inspiration. What we mean by that is that God is standing behind in a, in a um, uh, spiritual or in a, uh, a, an, analog, an analogous sense. I'm just giving an example here. God is, as it were, standing behind the human authors, speaking through the apostles, using their hand to write human words in a human language, through their human emotion. But he always gets through them his perfect words that cannot be altered and are completely inerrant without any mistake or failure. He uses humans to do that so that after the letter is written, we can say that in its original language is exactly as God wanted it written, as if he had written it himself in heaven. But he didn't write it in heaven. And, and this is what Islam says, is that the, the failure of the New Testament, the one of the things that makes it so unglorious is that God used men to write it. You know, in, in a lot of their tradition, one of the, the, the holy writings have either been delivered by angels or written with Allah in, you know, away uh, from, the, from you know, the, it was given by, and this is the difference, dictation. Maybe you did that back in, in high school you were, or in um, primary school. Dictation is the uh, practice of there being a reader and a writer. The writer is not inserting his opinions. The writer is not inserting his emotions. The writer is not doing anything other than being dictated what to write. And this is what we do not have with the majority of Scripture. Sometimes to Moses, sometimes to the prophets of the Old Testament, sometimes even to John in the book of Revelation, God says, take a pen, write this down. Da, 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 da. But by and large, even the story of that happening is not dictated. I want to give an example to make it a bit clearer. In our Bible, in say Psalm 51, when David is cast down because of his sin and is repenting, he is not simply sitting there. He has not elevated up into a uh, divine office where God is standing there and he dictates to David, write this down, David. Oh, yes, Lord, whatever. Gets out his pen, starts writing. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I am broke. I am a sinner. I am, do not cast your, do not cast me away from your presence or take my, your Holy Spirit from me. David says, ah, oh, yep, sure. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Next, Lord. Yeah, that's not how it worked. God didn't dictate and then David write down this emotional, heartbroken, gut-wrenching psalm. No, David, in the, in the wallowing of his repentance and his contrition, simply took a pen and parchment and wrote down what was going on in his heart and finds out maybe later, we don't know exactly what David knew, but at some point that was recognized as, oh, a God-written text. This is in fact, so we don't have dictation. We don't have that the God took the gospel writers or took, the, or took Paul when he wrote Galatia. He did not elevate them up into some divine office, tell them what to write. They simply write down what he told them and go back down. But in fact, the glory of it all is that God allowed Paul to, to be angry, fuming, furious, and right in his fury about the, the, the false teachers that were changing the gospel of justification by faith. He was fuming at this, wrote it down in large letters with his own hand in 
anger, finished it, sent it, and we can look at that picture and say, Paul wrote exactly the words in the meaning, in the tone, in the tense, exactly as God wanted it to be given. That's glorious. God doesn't need to remove human emotion and will and circumstance and language in order to get his point across. But in fact, he's so so wise, so, so infinitely powerful that he uses all of those things to work out exactly what it is he wants to say. And that human involvement, the human authorship through inspiration at no point gets in the way of God's divine revelation. Well, this also shows us that the sovereignty of God over this whole thing. And this is why uh, the Reformed faith is able to so uh, powerfully answer the questions of Scripture is because in this moment, as, as we believe that God uh, has the sovereignty to override human wills, choices, and decisions. And, and this is what has happened in the human authorship is whenever Paul would have maybe thought to write something untrue, thought to write something sinful, God stays his hand. God does not allow that to happen because we, are, we believe in the God who is sovereign over all things. And this shows us that, that doctrine comes nicely in and works with the doctrine of inspiration, that God was controlling them. And yet they were truly making free will decisions. This is what we see. This is what we learn. And, and this is the reality of the canon. And so we're going to uh, break now and come back and watch the next session where we continue to go on and defend the canon. But in this session, we have defined the canon in its three different ways, shown how the way that you define it determines when you say the canon was accomplished. And we've seen that really the whole source of the problem is that God, in his wisdom, chose to use human authors. But we see that that's not actually a problem, but in fact, a beautiful picture of God's involvement sovereignly with the world to achieve his purposes. Tune in for session number two.